Eli. Hi. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. And also, it's lovely that you're giving up part of your Sunday morning in Oakland, in Oregon. Oregon. So um, we're all very uh, in anticipation, something like anticipation. And we have some good questions. All I need is one that's ready. Right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we started off with Radha. We thought you might like to start with Radha. She's absolutely ready. <laughs> Radha, please. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Mm, and you. just should I just read my question? If you like. It's not my rule. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is about because you're with the Enneagram, yeah. So we know about your book. And uh, my question is um, are we already bringing our, our Enneagram fixation with us when we are born? It's genetic. It's it's genetic. Mm -hmm. Just like the color of your eyes. Okay. And then it's probably answered my the second part of my question. That and the second part would be, does it stay at the same time for the whole life? Also, is it always the if you were same? if you were born as a dog, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever your favorite hunt might be, you know? <laughs> Would you ask the question, oh, was I going to be born this way, or could I have been born a different kind of dog? And then would you ask, oh, do you think I'll stay this kind of dog until I die? <laughs> the animal is genetically imprinted. It has certain animal drives. The drives of the animal are to survive, reproduce, and protect the genetic heritage. We are DNA machines. We are programmed. We're programmed to breed, to communicate, in order to survive. And we have different patterns for that. And those patterns are genetic because they help the animal survive. And there's a genetic diversity. If all of us were were wired to be warriors, we would kill each other off. It wouldn't make it. You need peacemakers, you need homemakers, you need hunters and gatherers, you need different functions for the group to survive. It's a group trance and a group survival machine. And you are born with your genetics like you were born with the color of your eyes. And it doesn't have anything to do with waking up and being free, except that it's your greatest obstacle, and it's your gateway. And another part of my question would be, because you're using the word, it's also the gateway, how do you use the Enneagram in Can work to turn it up? freedom? Did you have to read that question, or was it really sincerely from your heart? Well, I was writing it and reading it. Yes, but, but in reading it, it was from your mind. I want to know what's alive in your heart. Why even ask this question? Well, I mean, you also said it's a gateway. <laughs> OK. So you want a gateway from where to where exactly? Very important. Well, I think from the conditioned mind. Yes. To the present moment and to the heart. Okay, from the conditioned mind to the heart. How far do you have to go? Yeah, we are not talking about miles. <laughs> Just willingness. 
And in order to have willingness, you have to be one-pointed. As long as you have a whole agenda, sometimes you'll be here, and sometimes you're there, and sometimes you're in your head, and sometimes you're in your heart, and you know you're mostly in your heart 80% of the time, or you're blah, 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 blah. All of that is from being divided. If you're one-pointed, nothing can stop you if what you want is heart. What true heart, true center, heart means center, means before everything. It means before your ego, before your body, before what you're calling being here now. Before that, before time and space, that's heart. And to be that is to give yourself 100%. To know that's what I want more than anything, and I put everything in that. If, well, I'm doing pretty well, life is good, I'm better now, and I'm having good relationships, I'm having fun, I'm in the now 90% of the time, and so really what I want to do is work on getting rid of my fixation. It's not that. It's a possibility to actually wake up and be free, to realize the truth. But it takes your full, 100%, undivided willingness and attention. Everything else is a distraction. So then you start telling the truth to yourself and how you distract yourself. What are the traps? And you'll find those traps are your fixation be based in survival, sex, and relationship. And you'll be tested. And if you have given yourself fully, sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll lose, but you'll always see deeper. You'll, you'll learn from how you lost. And you don't repeat it. That's intelligence. That's natural intelligence that is a function of love, actually. Getting out of the conditioned mind doesn't mean leaving intelligence, it means actually realizing it. Hmm. What are you aware of now? What I'm aware of. Sitting, listening. You aware of listening? Hmm? You said you're aware of listening? Well, what? What did you say you were aware of? Of sitting. Sitting. Sitting in the chair. Okay, good. Yeah. So this is called the egoic identity. The one who's sitting in a chair believes you are a body sitting in a chair. Mm -hmm. That's the obscuration to the truth of your heart. What if for a moment you are willing to not touch that identity as some woman sitting in a chair. What if you're not that? For just this moment. Then what are you aware of? What are you aware of now? This moment.
Now, this is where it begins. Are you going to move away? How? Why? It'll be your next thought to reincarnate into something substantial that can now capture what just happened. What if you don't move? That's the razor's edge, my teachers would say. One thought is too much of a load when you're walking on a razor's edge. Clear? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Hi. What's your question, Kamala? I really tried for a long time to put it in words. And I didn't really manage. Um, There's something I really want to ask you, but I can't put it in words, really. Forget about what you want to ask me. What do you really want? I want to be like played. You know, when it plays through you, then there's no doubt or nothing. And if you had that, what would that do for you? I could relax. I would feel secure. Hmm. You know, you can take pills for that. (laughs) (laughs) So are are you relaxed and secure right now? No. (laughs) Why not? Why not? In this moment, in this moment, What if you could completely relax? Just make believe you can. That's right. It can feel so good to just make believe that you are so relaxed. (laughs) Yeah, feels good. So what do you need to be secure about? Nothing right now. Very good. So then, when I asked you what you wanted, you wanted to go somewhere to get something so you could be relaxed and secure. Where'd you go? I just paused. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. See, so you paused it, which is like it'll restart again in a minute. But if you stop it, then it's over. Unless you restart it again which means you want something else, which would be natural because this isn't enough. This is a temporary state that you wanted. And it's better than the other one. But if you settle for a temporary state, you'll lose it again. So then you have to find out, what do I really want? Even deeper, 
What if it doesn't matter if I'm tense and uncomfortable and uptight? What's more important than that? What's more important than security? And you have to ask yourself these questions. And then you give your life to the answer. Everything else is just a search for comfort. It changes. Beautiful. Yes. Yes. So what do you really want? That's the question. Now that you're calm and secure. And even move my my head in this direction. I don't know. So this is something for you to explore in your own heart. What's more important? What's most important? And then you see how you betray yourself. How you settle for comfort or being agreeable or friendly or helpful. Or all the ways where you secretly betray yourself and you start telling the truth. You start individuating. What do you mean when you say you say the truth? That's for you to find out. What do you know? Realize it, don't hear it. You hear it and you believe it, it's a kind of trance. You realize it, you can't ever lose it, because there's nothing to lose. You hear it, you remember it, you believe it, you lose it. It's all conceptual. Yeah, and in days like today, it's like everything, everything is like, I don't know anything anymore, it's like, Yes. Nothing is stable. Yes. That's the truth. When you ask me what the truth is, you just spoke the truth. That moment. It's a moment of truth. And there's always deeper truth. But that's beautiful beginning. Yes. Your heart's breaking. You're suffocating. <laughs> so are you willing to risk everything? That's the question. If you're not willing to risk everything, for example, other people don't like you, maybe they'll throw you out, maybe you, you'll be yelled at, maybe you'll get angry and hurt somebody, maybe you'll be seen as a bad person. And just notice how you betray yourself for those thoughts. but you've tasted something deeper today. And that's the direction home. Yes, 
And every time you don't betray yourself, when you say yes when you mean yes, and no when you mean no, and you are clear in what that means, why, you, why you're saying yes, why you're saying that you're saying yes because you mean it, you're saying no because you mean it, that brings integrity. And the more you have integrity, the deeper your capacity to stay true to yourself, to stay true to what you love. What are you aware of now? Um. <laughs> um, it's like a um, space. Yes. But it feels open, like flowing. Yes, open space. And how are you separate from this open space? Are you? I kind of am and I'm not. How do you know? <laughs> Just this is how I feel. <laughs> but examine it. Which part is not open space? It's what I need, yeah, it's what I need to be able to answer your question. What you need to answer the question. Yeah. We call that consciousness. Is consciousness different from open space? Mm. No, very good. Just to hold it differently. Yes, very good. Depends on the point of view of consciousness. All states come and go, but if you stay with what you realize, rather than the experience, it informs your being and gives you the, gives you the capacity and the willingness to stand up in places where you haven't had integrity and stay true. And the more you're true, the deeper you fall into yourself. And when you fall all the way in and realize no separate parts, nothing that's not space, and you realize that, then you see your whole former identity as this woman, this person, this whatever it is. You see it for what it is from the other side. <laughs> yeah. And then when you inhabit it, you inhabit it fully, without all of the wars with yourself, without all of the suppressions, and without all of the ideas and beliefs and betrayals. And when they show up, those are your tests. But you're fully incarnate, you're fully alive. You're not just relaxed and secure. <laughs> Very good. This is your moment. It's a choice point of your life now.
There'll be huge pulls to bring you back. Back to the herd, back to the easygoing, friendly, kind, good, helpful. What do you do with herd then? Because herd is strong. Yes, I know. It's one of the traps. My teacher called it one of the nets that catch the fish on it swimming towards freedom. There are three nets. Survival, herd, sex. Each one catches the fish on the way to freedom. So you don't touch them. If you don't touch them, you pass right through them. They're not nets at all. If you touch them, it's sticky. You become identified. You become personalized. Suddenly you have fights for position and who's on top and what do you have to do and why you're not happy, why you're not comfortable. When hurt is there, I don't feel like there's no choice not to touch it. Oh, there's no choice now because you haven't gone all the way through. You're not free. You're still part of the machine. You identify yourself as this machine, as the part that's not open. That's what you think is me. <laughs> the part that's not open is me. That's the one who's suffering. That's the one who's already attached to the herd. And there's no choice there. You're right. That's the fixation. That's machine. Machine, there's no free will, there's no choice, it's mechanical. But if you choose to be free, that's the choice to uh, stand up in the face of everything, in face of the herd, in face of the conditioning, in face of your fixation. Then life begins. All this is like larval stage. <laughs> really. Larva, you know, larva, pre, it's a preform. It's like this is the caterpillar. You're in, you're in the caterpillar stage. Caterpillar doesn't have choices. It eats, it e it eats the leaves until... <laughs> The only difference is the caterpillar never has a choice to go into the cocoon and transform into a butterfly. It's all genetic. In your case, in our cases, this species, it has to take a conscious choice. Otherwise, you never cocoon. You stay a caterpillar your whole life. And we live in a world of caterpillars making believe they're butterflies. But it's a conscious choice, and it takes everything. And then you start to see, what am I not willing to give? Wow, the herd, that's big. Oh, it's huge. As long as you're part of the herd, you have herd mentality and you can't be free. That's why Papaji said, wake up and roar. Lions are never in a herd. You can appear to be in a herd. Papaji appeared to be in a herd. He appeared to be, he supported his family. He raised his children. He supported his wife. He brought his whole extended family over to live on the Hindu side. So he, was, he looked like he was part of the herd, but he wasn't. He was a lion in sheep's clothing. <laughs> it's 
So it's something you have to really reflect on. People talk about self-inquiry as if it's some magical formula that you're going to practice and get somewhere. It has nothing to do with that. Don't ever practice self-inquiry. Just deeply question yourself. Well, what if I, am I willing to give up the herd for freedom? That's a good question. And then you see the consequences. Am I willing to pay those consequences? And if you are, then you stop. Good enough. Carry on. And if you're not, you stop. Stop in mid-sentence. And you stay true to yourself, no matter what. If it means the herd leaves you, it leaves you. If it means it stays, it stays. But you don't stay. You stay still. You don't move with the herd. I'm glad. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. Hello, Eli. Hello. You have a question? I have not really a question. It was when I was question myself what a question I have. I notice I only want to to share this very moment with you. Why? And look uh, look what happened. Just uh, because you ask the question what do I really want? Yeah. As if you ask the other so I did already before. You did already before. Okay. Well, what'd you yeah. yeah what, so what's the answer? And the answer was that I put this question in the heart area as I close my eyes and then, and there is nothing I want. <laughs> okay, nothing you want, it's all good. There was nothing I want. Then the thought came that um, if I want something, it comes out of this to, to an action. Like and this, but the space is just there. This, and so this was beautiful through this question uh, to recognize this. Uh, I'm very touched from yeah from this. <laughs> Yeah. Ah. Beautiful day here in Ashland. <laughs> Where are you? Where I am? I'm in in uh, in Hitov. <laughs> 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 also beautiful. No oh, good. Spring is happening. It's a beautiful spring day. Yeah. Mm. No. <laughs> Bit cold. <laughs> cold still. Okay. Yeah. This is my first time at home in this month since 1983. I've been on the road. I've been teaching. I've been traveling. Yeah. So now this is my first May at my own home, in my own garden. It's fantastic. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very nice. Oh. <laughs> And what's your question? Uh, my question is, would you recommend meditation to an inner no. five? <laughs> Why would I recommend it or not recommend it? What do you want? I want to know. That's what you want? You want to know? Okay. If that's what you want, and you know that's your fixation, why would you ask me for anything? Yeah, basically, um, normally I never have a, a question to in any satsang or any... Yeah. Why is that? I'm using them by, by my own. I yes. To find my own. Yeah. yeah. If you get what you want to know, what will that do for you? I don't know. Then why do you want it? If you don't know, why do you want it? I mean, have some intelligent reflection on yourself. Why would you want something that you don't know? What the outcome will be. You must have some idea of what it will bring you. Yeah, it's the experience that brings something. Yes. So you're searching for experience. And what will the experience do for you? Then I would know. <laughs> and that will, what would that do for you? When I'm in the experience, then it's um, then I'm connected. And then you're not in the experience, you're not connected. How many times are you going to do that? Connecting? Or? How many times will you repeat searching for the experience, finding it and losing it and getting connected and disconnected and then searching for the next experience and finding it and knowing and then connecting and then losing it? How many times have you done it? How many times? More than you can count? No. <laughs> How many? I don't know. You don't know. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. No, it's I. Um, I I don't play this game, like I'm. What game? <laughs> you just said with that now I'm feel connected and now I'm not connected and. You just told me that I didn't tell you. You told me that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the game you're playing. And now you're telling me you don't play that game after telling me that that's the game you play. <laughs> uh, 
I don't understand. You want to know because if you know, then you'll have the experience of being connected. And then you lose the experience and you're disconnected. Then so you want to know so you can have the experience of being connected. You, that's what you said, right? Did you say that? Yeah. So let, let's let's say sometimes sometimes I swim in the river, and sometimes I look at the river. Yeah. Either way, you're drowning. <laughs> it's all based in fear. Living inside a very small box of fear. And then hungry for more experience and more knowing, as if that will get you out of the box. It won't. It gets you out for a moment. So really it's the willingness. But you're still at the very, you haven't started yet. You still think fulfilling your fixation of wanting to know will actually do something positive, even though it never has in your, it never gotten you to where you're finally happy. But you'll still try it for the short term hit because you're kind of addicted to it. And the addiction is the way of avoiding the terror, the emotional pain. Okay. Terror and emotional pain. Mm. And then you asked me, should you meditate or not? <laughs> Don't distract yourself. So you start by finding out what you really want. And if you start out saying, I want to know, you then question yourself. You don't need me to do it. OK, if I knew, then what? What do I want to know? Why do I want to know? What will that do for me? Will that bring me to freedom? Will it bring me to realization? Otherwise, what's the point? You're just distracting yourself. And you can play any games you want to distract yourself. I don't really care. First, you have to know what you want. Second, you have to be willing to tell the truth, the fearless, ruthless truth to yourself. Your own terror, your own emotional terror, your own avoidance of pain, your hiding, your running. Just tell the truth to yourself. And you see. The more deeply, ruthlessly honest you are, the more you expose to the light all the dark, hidden places, the more transparent everything will be. But that is not possible until you know what you want and you're willing to face the consequences. Otherwise, you're just avoiding everything. OK? Thank you. Alles klar? Alles klar. <laughs>
the inside here, through the airwaves, through the circuits, back to you, into the sound, into the airwaves, back into your brain, to understand what I said, and then you say, yes, this is the present moment. It's impossible to be in the present moment in a body like that, isn't it? You're always hearing the past. By the time this visual image gets to you and you process it in your brain and you make sense of it, it's already past. So why do you want to be in the present moment? So you're just talking about wanting to be a better functioning robot. To be able to do your work and do the da and just show up and da 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 da. But why? Will that bring you fulfillment and lasting peace? What do you really want? Because I know that's not what's alive in your heart, to want to be in the present moment. That's an idea. It's mental. That's somebody, it's an ego in control trying to be spiritual. Actually, I don't know what I really want. Very good. That's a good start. That's the beginning. Don't believe anything. Don't read anything. Don't hear anything. Stay alone with yourself and find out. What's your life worth living? Why are you doing this job, whatever it is? Why are you... Why? What's your life about? Is it worth it? Then you start asking yourself the real questions. You'll get the real answers. Then when you get the real answer, then you have to be willing to give your life to the truth of it. So first you have to know what you want. That's big. Then you have to know, are you willing? Are you willing for what you want? Not how, but are you willing? If you're willing, everything takes care of itself. If you're not willing, you will search for how, for techniques, for process, for finding the answers in your childhood, whatever it is. Well, that's the avoidance of willingness. So once you have what you want and you are willing, then it begins. Right now, you haven't begun yet. Then it begins. Then you're tested how much you want it. Who said so? Okay, so reflect on it. Good. Thank you. I have been here for two weeks, uh, and in my, in my other life, I'm working um, with young people and refugees. 
And so I, I thought uh, my question is how to transfer the experience of awareness of being here <laughs> and doing something else to the world outside. Realize don't it. That. You don't explain it. If you explain it, you're teaching yeah. another religion. Yeah. You don't want to be a missionary. It's yeah. beautiful you have this good work. What you can do is actually transmit it to them by being it. And you can only be it if you're willing to let go of everything you think you are, every identity you have, to find the truth. Because all the identities that you have of who you believe yourself to be are what's between you and the realization. If you're willing to turn your back on everything that you think is real, you'll find reality and you realize what you are, who you are, where you are. And when that realization is established by your being true to yourself, by your committing yourself 100% to that truth, then there's no obscuration between that truth shining and your work with your refugees and children. Then it's truth shining, it's love shining. And nothing needs to be spoken, but people will catch it. And those who are ready will be called to you and will ask you questions. Mm. Yeah, it's very easy, actually. <laughs> no, it's, it's not easy. Not so difficult. If it was easy, everybody, it's easy. <laughs> if it was easy, everybody would be awake. It's simple, but not easy. Simple. Simply stop. Right now. Stop. If it's so easy, just stop now. Right here, this moment. Leave everything you thought you were behind. If you're not a woman, if you're not a helper, if you're not a body, if you're not an ego, if you're not a mind, then what are you? Find out. Realize it. Simple, not easy. Looking up there is looking to your head to find an answer. You won't find the answers in your head. So where do I find it? In the depths of your soul. That means turning your back on everything you think is real to find reality. Up there, you'll never find it. That's right. Up there, you find thoughts and ideas and pictures. Thoughts. If you live in a world of thoughts, you're not living in reality. You're living in your ideas of reality, in your talking to yourself about reality. So you, that you believe that story that you tell yourself is real. I had the feeling I, I find it w uh, while I'm cooking, for instance. You find what? When I'm cooking. Cooking? Yeah, what do you find? Um, simple things, just doing something with a... Yeah, that's not it. That's not it. Let me tell you, having moments of no mind happen every day, all the time, to everybody. Naturally. That's not it. Great athletes, when they're in the zone, there's no mind, there's no thought, there's no personality, there's just the pure movement, which is transcendent of the, of the body's limitations in a way, doing things that the body never did before in a completely unified way. It's beautiful, but it's not awake. They don't finish that experience, they don't finish that race and then they're enlightened and free and they're liberated and they never have to do anything else again. They need to prepare to run the next one. Up there you'll only find confusion. That's the avoidance of terror. Let me tell you, I'll give you a clue. Every time you go into your head like that, 
to talk to yourself, have a picture, or whatever it is, you're avoiding terror. Terror has been running your whole life and you've been hiding behind everything else. So when you stop avoiding terror, you can start to meet what's here. And if you're willing to meet what's here, you'll find what's deeper. But first you have to know what you want. What I want? Mm. Peace. Where's the war? Outside. Oh, so you want peace outside. Everything's good inside, right? (laughs) Not always, but (laughs) right now. (laughs) Yeah, right now. But right now passes. Yes, I want peace in the world also. But I'll never get peace in the world until you can realize it yourself. And you can't realize it until you're willing to turn towards the fear and away from your mind. You mean you have to be um, without fear to be awake? No. You have to be willing to not... I mean that fear doesn't matter. You're free to feel it if it's here, and you don't feel it if it's not here. To be awake is to realize who you are, without doubt, beyond all form, beyond all ideas, beyond belief. When you realize the truth of yourself, then you're free. Till then, not yet. Almost, closer, not yet. And you can't realize who you are unless you're willing to give up who you think you are. Because who you think you are is the only obstacle. Who you believe yourself to be. Who you've invested yourself as. What was that thought? How to go there. Good. So now you had a thought how to go there. But you sit here smiling as if there was no thought. But I saw it. And you knew it. But you faked it. That's how you spend your life, faking it. That thought how to go there is the avoidance of terror. But rather than take that, you believe the next thought, how to go there, as if there's some place to go, and you have to do something to get there. That's the ego. That's the fixated mind. The fixated mind will never be free. But you can be free of the fixated mind. You can be free of the fixated mind. But so far you don't want to. You're too, you're too scared. That's what the question, how to go there? That question means, I'm too afraid to face what he just said. I didn't really understand the last sentence. I thought so. What did you hear? What did I hear? Something with afraid. (laughs) What could it have said? What could I have said? Why? I don't know. No, what do you imagine I could have said when you heard afraid? 
I just thought if I'm really afraid of something. Yes. Then what? About what? Okay. If you're really afraid of something, so what? Yeah. So what? What does it mean? Why do you have to think about it? So anyway, I think that we're having a translation difficulty from my my lips to your ears. Somehow it's not getting all the way through. Maybe it's the uh, sound in your room. And maybe, maybe, you came with a good question. Mm. I'm working with refugees and children. How do I pass on to them? I don't know what you wanted to pass on to them. I guess what you're getting in your community. But how can you pass it on to them? You wanted to pass on something good. You wanted to pass on something alive and loving and good to them, right? Right? That's your question. Not the question? I thought that was your question. I will, I, I will leave that field. I will not work there anymore. That's what I decided here. Oh, terrible. Terrible? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, your, I thought your question was how to bring it to them. That wasn't your question? Yeah. That was your question. So how are you going to bring it to them if you already decided to leave? So you really got a lot of you know, you're, you're kind of a little crazy right now. Too many thoughts. Why would you leave something good where you're helping people and then come here and say, how can I bring it to them? And you're not willing for your own. You're not willing to stop your own suffering. So now you're confronted, you're confronted with the possibility of having to stop your own suffering before you can help anyone else. And that means facing your own terror and stop thinking, stop talking to yourself. You have an imaginary friend in your head keeping you company and safe, talking to you about things. It's not real. It's just the avoidance of terror. It's just the avoidance of terror. If anybody else has their mic on, maybe turn it off because that will help the sound clarity. No, it's okay. I understand. So, why not continue helping where you can help? I mean, my God, you were doing good. Why would you want to stop that? Because I did it for 35 years now. That was enough. I will go on half, um, I mean, more six months, and then I'm going to change the job situation. And if you think, do you think that changing the job situation will help you? Wherever you go, you're going to show up. That's the problem. So for your last six months there, why not bring them love and peace and truth? But that starts with you. Why not you realize love and peace and truth and be willing to bring all the demons out of the closet, all the scary nightmares out from under the bed? So you can face it. Okay. I will. Thank you. Good. Yes. Okay. So, what's your question, Om?
It's like I would not know anything. And also not be anywhere. It's like that, huh? What is it not like? There seems to be just some contraction. What do you want, Om? To experience the full depth of myself. Do you have to have your eyes closed for that? <laughs> Who gave you the name Om? John David. How come? Because uh, there's a vibration and quietness, which comes through my heart. Which is so when you say a vibration and quietness, isn't a vibration noise? Everything that vibrates has a sound, right? Isn't that, isn't that what music is, vibrating? Yes. In a, in a way, it's true. Mm. <laughs> Who were you before you were home? Do your eyes have to be closed? What's the difference when your eyes are open? Are you still home? <laughs> Who are you before you were home? Just the same. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like putting lipstick on a pig, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. 
You can open your eyes, it's okay. <laughs> no need to go anywhere or create anything or experience anything. No need to do anything. You can just What's going on, Om? What was your name before it was Om? Nico, Nico. Nico. Oh, I had a great name, Nico. Now Nico has some uh, sound to it. That's 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 good. That's got some energy, Nico. Nico, Nico, Nico. <laughs> Fuck. Oh. <laughs> 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 Live life with your eyes open, Nico. Eyes wide open. Take it in head first. And then just tell the truth to yourself. Deeply. You don't have to be any particular way. There's no spiritually correct way to be. Okay, alles klar? Good. Any questions? No, sir. Thank you. Hi. You have a question, Rajan? You speak about this uh, emotional pain, um, emotional terror. Um, yeah, it's it's what I want to accept. Just accept it as part of being. Why do you want to accept it? <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> well, 
<laughs> yeah, maybe it doesn't need acceptance. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it, yeah, it, it comes anyway. It's uh, yeah. See, accepting it or not accepting it is not the right answer. Mm. It's a invitation in. It's an invitation to heartbreak. If it goes away, you'll have lost your chance. If you accept it, which means, okay, it can be here, it doesn't matter, I'll carry on, it's not that. It's an invitation in. But first you have to know what you want, otherwise you won't be willing to pay that price. What do you want? Mm. <sighs> just, <clears throat> just uh, like being who I am. If you want to be who you are, there are certain steps. The first step is to know who you are. <laughs> sounds like the last step too. <laughs> it's actually, it's the first step. <laughs> and as long as you believe you know who you are you'll never know because you're living in a belief you're living in an idea and a concept and it may be a momentary experience or two it's not that there's a certainty in realization that is beyond question, beyond doubt, beyond thought, beyond remembering or forgetting or practicing. Once you know yourself, then you can be yourself. Everything else is an act. Yeah, it's um, it's it's so ridiculous to take this act seriously. It's uh, it's like yeah. just a very old habit. Yeah, but what's running it? See, you don't have to take the act seriously, but you have to take seriously is how come? Why have you been running this act your whole life? What have you been avoiding? Mm. And then you look at all the pain you've been avoiding. If that's ridiculous, so what? Meet that. Tell me how ridiculous it is. Then you find the underpinnings that run the act, that you believe are real, that you've been avoiding. The deep self-hatred, the deep fear of not knowing. So, uh, <clears throat> <laughs> What was this, uh, this underpinning for you? Do you remember? <laughs> what was the underpinning for me? Yeah. Of my fixation? I know what, the underpinning of my fixation was lust. It was pleasure, enjoyment. It was, I, of course I wanted to be high. It was knowing the truth, all of that, but it was all being run by this egoic identity. But deeper than the egoic identity, I always had this desire for truth. And I wouldn't sell out for pleasure over freedom. 
and I was tested all along the way. When I was 17 years old, 1965, when the civil rights movement was happening in my country and black people were being beaten and dogs put on them and fire hoses and killed, I was in 1964, I was a senior in high school when people from my neighborhood went to Mississippi and were killed. People from, like me went to Mississippi to help people vote and they were killed. That was terrifying to be caught in a Mississippi swamp by these monster redneck Ku Klux Klan guys and killed in the swamp. What could be worse? I was terrified. The next year, not, not the next year, that was summer of 64. By March of 65, Selma was happening, where people were trying to march to, from, to the state capitol and were being beaten with, with clubs and fire hoses and dogs. And a bus showed up that was going to, to Alabama. And I was told about it from my college. I was a first year student at college, at university. I was 17 years old. And I found out there's a bus going. And I had to get on that bus because I wanted freedom. People said, well, if you get on the bus, you're going to have an FBI record. It's going to ruin your career. I did end up with an FBI record, but it wasn't from that. It was a couple of years later. But getting on that bus, in the face of the day before, a white minister, Reverend Reeb, had gone to Selma on just this kind of bus. And when he got off the bus, they beat him to death. Now I'm on the bus going to Alabama because I had to, because it was alive in my heart. Not because I should or I should. It was alive, and I had to follow it, even though I was terrified, even though I might get an FBI record, even though I could be killed. I had to go. And that informed my life and all my decisions after that. From that point on, I was out of the normal world. When I was standing on the street in Alabama, and these men on horseback with cowboy hats and clubs and came charging towards us, I said, this is America, 1965. And it shattered my illusion of what it was to be an American. It shattered. And that liberated me. It's alienating. It's painful. No one wants to lose their illusion. They become disillusioned. But it was liberating. And each step where freedom called me, if I got on that freedom train, and I did, another illusion was burst. Another level of freedom was opened. Fixation was still running. I still wanted to have fun. <laughs> I still want to have fun. Why not? I love life. I love, I enjoy love. Love loves so much. I love my garden and I love my partner most of all. I'm married to a goddess and I love her. We've been together since 1976. Not because I wanted to be in a relationship, I never did. That's what showed up. And it's the greatest gift God has ever gave me. And to meet my teacher. I searched for 18 years. I went through all of it. All the spiritual teachers, all the things. I ran a Tibetan Buddhist center. I taught in a Zen, mon in a Zen temple in Japan. I was initiated into a Sufi circle in Morocco. I was searching everywhere for a true teacher. And he called me and I found him. And his mission was the same as my mission was for the world to wake up. And so when I found him, I brought him my wife. I told him, she's the Satguru. We named her Gangaji. She spread satsang around the world. And that's why you're in this group now. People had never heard of satsang in the West. This is Papaji's gift. All the millions of satsang teachers that have propped up in every yoga center, that's all from Papaji. There was no satsang before Papaji. 
there was bhajan, there was meditation, there was practices, there was all kinds of rituals and retreats, and, but not satsang. So this is Papaji's gift. And it comes from his commitment to freedom. So, it's up to you. Doesn't mean emotional pain goes away, doesn't mean heartbreak goes away. It goes deeper. But it's for you, it's a way in. For me, it's just heartbreak. I mean, I see what's happening now in Israel. It's so heartbreaking that these this is my identified tribe. And they are racist, apartheid murderers. That's so heartbreaking to me. Because my whole identity as a child growing up, my moral identity was that I was a good, I would never let it happen again. We were the oppressed. We were the victims. We were the good guys. And now to see my people as the bad guys, well, that's so painful. But I feel it. So pain doesn't go away. But your capacity to be free and live a free life is always here. It doesn't change. It doesn't come and go. It doesn't blink on and off. But if what's more important is avoiding emotional pain, if what's more important is staying relatively safe and comfortable in your head, then you'll betray yourself over and over again. Okay, thank you so much. All right, yes. All right, this is a good time to stop. That's a perfect point. So glad we got to meet this way. So Eli, thank you. Thank you very much. We will be in the sword, the sword of truth with great, uh, I don't know the right word, but thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm so so glad, because, you know, my mission is to pass it on. And uh, right. I'm grateful for this opportunity to meet with people here. And uh, right. Well, we certainly enjoyed this. I don't know, enjoyed might not be the right word, because your <laughs> sword is uh, sharp, <laughs> sharp. Yeah. You know, I'm a, right. I'm a student of my master. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank Bye. you. Bye.